All right, let's roll, baby. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Rock Metal Podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, and today on Rock Metal Podcast, we have Shimon, and they have a new album called Memories and Intuition, which is released on September 10th, and right now I'm being joined by Farhad to share some more information about this stellar release, where his memories are, where his intuition is, how they came together to make this album. So, Farhad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. I dig the stuff. I think I've been trying to... Uh, I feel sometimes like I'm, I'm tugging on John's shirt. Like, hey, hey, hey. Um, it feels like it's been a thousand years since my last memories of Water Under the Sun that I've been trying to uh, get you guys on. Because we mentioned in the pre-roll, Prague is this dirty word. But you guys aren't following the recipe of the dirty word. Right. Yeah, I mean, we've got... You know, there's definitely progressive elements in our music. You know, there's the odd time signatures. Uh, you know, sometimes we do write extended pieces of music and instrumental segments and things like that. Um, but, you know, a lot of our songs are in bite-sized chunks, right? So, that, you know, we fit that four to five minute model um, and we do write catchy hooks, uh, singable melodies that people can kind of attach themselves to that are necessarily prog fans. Uh, you know, so, and I, I think a lot of that comes from just our general love of 80s music, non, you know, like 80s pop music or whatever. They have these huge, big, catchy choruses and things like that. And then we kind of adapted that, um, that model of writing. And because we grew up to bands like Rush and things like that, you know, some of that obviously carried over as well. And it was just naturally um, a blending of the two genres, essentially. So it's like progressive rock, progressive metal, but uh not so self-indulgent i guess but we can be at times yeah but yeah for the most part it's, uh mo for the most part we write for the song and let that dictate where pieces of music goes rather than the other way around yeah it's funny it's almost unintentionally whenever i have a prog band on the conversation almost starts there like uh we're prog metal but <laughs> yeah and I think people have to explain themselves because every time they say we're prog metal, uh, you know, it's like, okay, so they sound like Periphery or, you know, they sound like Dream Theater. You know, there's the different camps. So you kind of have to explain yourself so you know where in that, you know, in the different buckets of prog metal you fall so they can get a better idea of what kind of prog metal band you are or a prog rock band or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's like, you know, like, oh, what kind of band are you? A oh, rock and roll band. Like, that could be in any, that could be anything, you know? Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. Especially today, where the mustache is making a comeback. <laughs> the mullet, too, I hear. Yes. So, watch out for that. You, yeah. you do. You do got to watch out for that. But your look, I dig it. So keep it up, baby. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Now, speaking of Dream Theater, the first thing that I thought of when I saw your artwork was Dream Theater. I was reminded of... Um, just the artistic style kind of reminded me of, of theirs. Was that an influence at all? Yeah, it was. Uh, in, in fact, when I was doing the cover, "Awake" was the album cover that kind of um, triggered the initial like, "Oh, okay, I, I can do this like uh, collage kind of treatment like they do." And, and they used to do that, I guess, on a lot of their older records. Um, but yeah, there's definitely influence in the art from Dream Theater, like blatant Dream Theater <laughs> ripoff art <laughs> work right there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was thinking of. Uh, gonna lie about that. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of seasons, and then uh, immediately when I I saw the artwork, I was like, oh yeah, and then. Awake. You mentioned Awake. Initially, it was Seasons, yeah. but uh, yeah. Man. Yeah, I can see Seasons, I guess. Yeah. It's got the, it's got the kid, right? And the, the, the snow with the shovel and all that stuff. All these different elements. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, then... Same, same concept, essentially. I know. And then they had images and words, and you have memories and intuition. And that was not... That was, that was not planned. <laughs> but that, that turns out... I mean, we obviously have a similar way of thinking, but uh, yeah. That yeah. was coincidence. Sweet. Now, uh, speaking of coincidence, memories and intuition, what is this album about? Because obviously that name sort of conjures up that there may be a bit of depth to this record. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it touches on, so in the, our previous album was a concept album. This one, I wanted to write like individual pieces of songs that stand on its own. Um, but there's still a conceptual element of it where I'm tying memories and intuition. Memories, obviously, tailoring to the past and intuition uh, lending its hand towards the future. So it's just kind of like blending the two, like how much 
of your memories dictates how your future is going to be um, and how much of your future is colored because of your memories. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a play on the past and the present, essentially, and, and how that molds you uh, in the present. It sounds very almost almost even academic. Are you a psychology major by chance? <laughs> I'm not, but I am intrigued intrigued by psychology for sure. Yeah, no, I mean we could turn this podcast into thoughts on memories <laughs> and how our memories influence those thoughts on memories. The repressive memories that shape your future. Yeah, exactly. And how real a memory even is. It's all an illusion, man. Depend on how it, how you take it, I guess, right? Yeah, very true. And then, can, sorry. Okay. No, I was just saying. You know, some of us have false memories, right? We think something happened, and mm-hmm. it's not exactly the way we imagined. Yeah. Or it's not exactly the way the reality was. Yeah. But we imagined it a different way. Yeah. Because each time we remember it, we oddly enough have to create the memory in order to, or some, something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. I and mean, we're essentially recreating it, and you know, it's kind of it's kind of like a telephone, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the more farther you're away from it, you start, you know, hearing the discrepancies, things start changing. You start adding things to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, some memories are probably like that for sure. And, and some of them are more sub and, you know, just kind of ingrained in your, your memory cells, I guess. Yeah. I always have uh, six pack abs and hair like yours, uh, in my memories. How to be your intuition for nineteen ninety five? Three easy payments. I'll sell you this little cream here. What? And we'll give you exactly. I know. Just kidding. I know. Those would be the memories of water that you've got right there, right? There you go. Yeah, and this is indeed water in here. So there you go. Continuing on that, so memories and intuition is the album title, but then we have this track, "Memories of Water," which I believe is like the lead single off the album. Correct. Yep. Yep. Is there a connection to those two things? Was that done on purpose? Uh, no, I think, so I wrote this album pretty quickly in a, in a period of maybe like four months. So I think, uh, the space that I was at, at the time, uh, kind of lends itself to writing in a similar style with similar, um, topics, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was kind of in a retrospective place in my life at the time. So there's a lot of hints at memories and, 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 and intuitions of like what will be and things like that. So a lot of the songs kind of deal with that kind of subject matter. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Aside from the album, and without getting too personally deep, I guess, <laughs> how was that time of your life and how did you move beyond that or out of that? What did you take with you? Um, yeah, usually any kind of uh, turbulent moment, uh, I find solace in just writing. So that's kind of like the way how I exercise uh, feelings and emotions and things like that. I'm a pretty private person, so I don't really share my feelings and thoughts uh, that easily. <laughs> so my way of coping with it is just writing lyrics. Um, so that's why there's a kind of string that ties all these songs together. So even though it's not a concept album, it's a thematic album in a sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. A lot of times they're uh, in Prague, there's usually a, a concept, but you mentioned more theme-based, and we're obviously chatting about that that theme right now. Yeah, Yeah. I, 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 I steer away from, like, you know, concept, you know, if it's like, you know, I don't know, like dragons and things like that, imaginary Lord of the Rings kind of scenarios. Uh, I... It's cool. It's just not where I uh, find solace in uh, writing that kind of stuff. Like I, I'm more introspective, I guess, rather than the other way around. Yeah. So, I guess my next question is: Was it? Are you just the the sole writer on the record, or did you have some? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was the sole writer for this one. Okay. Uh, previous the previous album, we did have Jose, our bass player, um, write some music for one of the tracks on there. But generally, yeah, I'm the, I'm the lead writer. Okay. You let a bass player do some writing. How did that go? <laughs> well, I mean, we've known each other forever, so we've been in bands all throughout, you know, since we were teens. Um, so, he, I mean, I know he's a good songwriter. He just has to find the time to actually want to do it, you know. Uh, he, he's, he's a great songwriter. He just doesn't do it enough. And hopefully next record I can get some more of his ideas in there. You know, I'm definitely, I'm not the kind of guy that's just like, I don't want anybody to write. It's all my ideas or nothing. I mean, I, I definitely want... Uh, and welcome other ideas. Um, they just haven't had the time to do it. Um, so hopefully that changes as you know we keep continuing to write and put out records. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
Now, something else that I've got across my desk here is there's a bunch of different drummers on this record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as the same with our, so our first record had a few drummers. I think there's like three or four drummers on our first record. Second record, we, I mean, we have a live drummer. Um, so he actually played on the second album. On the third album, he let us know, like, hey, I don't want to record. Uh, I just want to continue being the live drummer. So we had to reach out to a bunch of drummers. So reached out to Mark Zonder from Fate's Warning. He was on our first record. Um, so he happily signed up. Uh, so we have him on two tracks. Um, Atma Anur, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He played drums for Jason Becker. He's done stuff with Journey. Uh, I reached out to him. He was game. He's on two tracks. So we're like, sweet. He was uh, one of the first drummers I really got into because I was a big, huge uh, Tony McAlpine fan. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his music. He's one of those uh, shrapnel, shredder, like Ingve kind of players. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was into that guitar instrumental stuff when I was young. And Atma Noor pretty much played on all their records. So that was my exposure to him. So I was like, sweet. He's playing on our record. Um, and then I've got a friend, Chris, uh, who's playing on a track. Uh, and then there's, of course, the amazing Thomas Lang, who's like, you know, world's greatest drummers. Um, and I randomly shot him a message on Instagram, believe it or not, um, and just kind of let him know, like, hey, you know, I, I have worked with uh, pretty established drummers before. So, you know, just give us a listen if you like it. Uh, you know, it would be an honor to have you on our record. And he didn't he didn't respond. I, I didn't expect him to. Um, and then a couple of months later, randomly, I just got an email from him like, hey, I checked out the stuff. This is fantastic. I'd love to play on it, uh, which kind of like blew me away. I was just like, oh, my God, that's that's insane. So like all my plans, I was like anybody that had um, initially signed up to play those songs, I was just like, hey, I'm sorry, Thomas Lang is going to be playing on these songs. Appreciate it. But these songs are going to him. Um, and, and that's how that came about. I, I'm still like amazed that he's he's on this record he's he's such an accomplished drummer um yeah amazing i think that's all we have right yeah i, I also so. have a leo margaret oh right uh, how could i forget yeah leo uh he's the drummer of pain pain of salvation mm -hmm. uh which was a band that i really loved uh in the mid 2000s or so um he was a referral from the audio mixer who mixed a bunch of pain of salvation stuff so linked up with him super cool guy uh a badass of a drummer uh that everybody should check out leo margaret if you don't know him check out the band pain of salvation they're phenomenal um so he's on a couple tracks as well he's on the second single under the sun okay i've got a couple of questions about that first question is how do you juggle all that? Like, do you do, do you let the drummers pick which songs they want to work on? Did you have something in mind, knowing their style or their sound of their kits or whatever? Well, yeah, no, because uh, my initial plan was that our live drummer would be playing on the on, <laughs> on all of them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but there's a certain way that I write that kind of tailors itself to some of the drummers. Like uh, the the songs that I gave Mark Zonder definitely has a feel that he would be comfortable with. Uh, and we worked with him before, so I know we work well together. Um, so that was just an easy call for me. It was just like, all right, I'm going to give him those tracks. And there's two instrumental tracks. Uh, and being that Atma Noor played on mostly instrumental tracks that I, that I loved, uh, it made sense for me to give him the instrumental tracks. Mm -hmm. um, and Thomas, uh, it was just, he could do anything, really. So I was just like, I gave him everything from like the poppy stuff to the uber technical stuff and and he just killed it one take on all of them which is insane mm -hmm. um and then leo i i basically had two songs left um and you know i was just like hey these are the two that i have would you be willing to play and he checked it out and you know he dug it enough that he wanted to play on them so that's kind of how it kind of unfolded but yeah no i never planned on okay i'm gonna write a song that's uh you know tailored to you know the different drummers yeah um because i have no idea who's gonna play drums in, in the beginning i mean i thought it was gonna be our our live drummer but that turned out not to be the case mm -hmm. good this, times man <laughs> it is good times it is good times uh when you said that last thing about like hey here's what's left kind of reminded me of being at the end of the halloween candy bowl and you're like oh, yeah it's just candy corn that's left and yeah like, the candy corn <laughs> uh yeah, hopefully the songs aren't like the candy corns of the album, right? That's uh, yeah. yeah. I try not writing candy corn music, so okay. hopefully they're all like the Snickers, you know, the yeah, or, or the Quicks bars or whatever, right? Yeah, 
I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Reese kind of guy. I love the peanut butter cups. Oh, that's my favorite. Peanut butter cups. Sweet. Sure. Frozen. You got to try them frozen. The best. Okay. My interest has been piqued. <laughs> then the other question I had about drummers was, because the audio mixer said, hey, you got to work with this guy. And um, we've done a bit of audio mixing ourselves here at the studio. And there's definitely a way that a drummer can come across where I could see an audio mixer saying, hey, you should work with this guy because he hits hard, he hits consistent, he shows up, he does the work. I mean, there's so many things outside of, I guess, just technical level. But in your working with all these different drummers, what have you noticed that's, I don't know, maybe consistent or maybe different? Has it changed your perspective on drummers? Um. So it, it's weird. Uh, so I'm, you know, primarily a, a guitarist and a vocalist, um, but I've always wanted to be a drummer. So, you know, just, my parents wouldn't get me a drum set. And, you know, I, I, I don't blame them because it's super loud. And I can imagine like a beginner drummer playing in the basement somewhere it would just drive everyone mad. Yeah. Um, but when I listen to music, I kind of focus on the rhythmic element of it first. Uh, even when I write songs, sometimes I'll write a drum groove first and then put the, the, the musical bed on top of it. Um, so when it comes to these drummers, like I was so familiar with all of their work anyway, I kind of, I kind of knew what I was going to get. Um, the, the surprise was just Thomas Lang. I didn't know what he was going to do just because it was Thomas Lang and he's so amazing. I was like, how is he going to reinterpret some of my, you know, like drum machine tracks? Um, right. and you know, for some things I would, I would be like, you know, if you can follow this, cause it's, it's pretty, you know paramount to the song or it's following the bass line completely so i want the drum beat to to remain the same and then there are sections where i was just like look this is all just filler go to town do whatever you want whatever you do i'm sure it'll be fine yeah um he's the only one um that didn't have any revisions whatsoever he just whatever he did was like the first take and that was that was great um a few revisions with everyone else and but that was just because um I, i'm pretty picky and my decision isn't always the best decision maybe, but it's the one I feel is the best. So, um, with Thomas, um, it, it, it just kind of translated how I imagined it would. Uh, whereas with the other guys, um, like I, I saw my vision kind of being, um, compromised a bit, Mm -hmm. you know? So I was like, Oh, this is great, but can you do it like this? And there are all team players and they're great. Uh, you know, and they're fun and awesome to work with, so they were pretty accommodating. Um, so yeah, cool. I don't know if that answers the question, honestly, but <laughs> that's that's what I got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was fine. So we chatted about memories of water under the sun. There's videos for those available on today's show notes. We chatted about memories and intuition, the album out September 10th, uh, which will more than likely be out by the time this interview airs, and. We chatted about Dream Theater a little bit. We chatted about Rush. We chatted about AOR, uh, which for those of you listening in, that is a special genre that mostly is a lot of the 80s music we've heard. That's like Toto and Journey and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, We chatted about writing out of an emotional funk. We chatted about working with great drummers and guest drummers. Um, I think we hit everything. Did management want us to touch on anything else for Hot, or is that it? That's... uh (laughs) pretty much it let me let me yeah i think that 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 covers us okay beautiful sounds good well thank you so much for coming on to the prog rock and prog metal podcast today thanks for having me man appreciate it 